In the first two sections, we talked about a standard quadratic equation and how the quadratic formula can be used to, to plug in and solve for it. And we did some legwork on connecting algebra to geometry, specifically the ability to see a sum of squares as both an algebraic statement and a geometric statement. In this section, we're going to actually find out why the quadratic formula solves the quadratic equation using a process known as completing the square. Let's start out though by giving a couple more examples of quadratics and how to solve them. You'll notice that these examples are going to be easier than the one that we started out with. Easier that is, not because the arithmetic turns out easier, but because I've been trained to recognize patterns in these quadratics. And I know that this one right here is a sum of squares. I know that this is the same thing is x plus 1 squared equals 0. What's the square here? It might be worth inventing a few of these for yourself and writing them down just to get used to the patterns if it's been a while. In school, algebra classes tend to spend a lot of time having you develop heuristics for how to tell if you're looking at an expression that factors like this. To be able to recognize the easy quadratics and then use the quadratic formula on the hard ones. Uh, one other pattern that comes up here that's worth mentioning, just because it comes up all the time and is worth recognizing when it stares you in the face, is the so-called difference of squares. And that looks like this. So in the same way, you have these two binomials multiplied, and they're the same except for their sign, and they end up multiplying out and adding together to give you the big square minus the little square. So a homework problem I'll give you now that's a little bit harder. In the last section, we proved the sum of squares geometrically using a drawing. Now, I want to ask you if you can prove this algebraic statement using a drawing. The tricky thing about this, to do it geometrically or historically accurately, is that you're not allowed to treat this as a negative number. So your drawing can't have a negative b somewhere on it. You have to think about negative b as taking a little bit away from a. That's a little bit harder to do, and the drawing that will help you out isn't as simple to interpret as the, sum, as the big drawing equals the sum of its parts, the way it worked out for, for our first one. But if you're inventive about it, you can probably figure it out. Here's another one too. What if we just have this square? We know that that's going to be from algebra. This is very similar to the sum of squares, but with this negative term in the middle. So if your lengths are a, this whole thing being a, and instead of adding b onto the end, we take b away, this is b, so that what's left over is a minus b, what's that square going to look like, and how do we know it's the same thing as all those parts put together? That's your homework question for today. Okay, back to the problem. Uh, once school is done teaching you to recognize the cases that you can factor, you're then given the sledgehammer, the quadratic formula, and if you want, you can just forget all the heuristics and go swinging with the quadratic formula wherever you want. But why does it work? Finally, we're going to show the procedure known as completing the square that connects the quadratic formula to the quadratic equation. Just like Al Khwarizmi, we'll show this by a geometry. And unlike him, we'll also show what this procedure looks like in our modern symbols. Let's go back to our original equation. We'd like to solve this problem, but that one might be a little bit hard for us still. So let's solve a different one. And this is a good example of a skill to pick up on in math. If something's too hard, find something easier that's similar that you can do. And maybe solving the easy problem will help you learn how to solve the hard one. So the easy quadratic I want to do it's, it's not super easy, it's still not factorable, but you'll see there's some regularities to the numbers that are going to help us out a little bit along the way. By the way, Al Khwarizmi would have called this a square plus 10 roots is 144. Um, he would of course have the 144 on the other side because he didn't have negative numbers. We'll do, we'll do this problem the way Al Khwarizmi would have done it. So the first thing we do is we draw a square with sides x. x is the thing that's squared, so let's draw a square with x. Yeah? Okay, so there's our square with x. Yeah? And now what we do is we take the number of roots that we have and we chop them in half. So 
If we, if we have 10x, I'm going to chop in half. We get 5x and another 5x. And the way we're going to add them into our drawing is here we have something that's x high. And so if we make it a little bit bigger so that there's x high and 5 up here, then this rectangle is 5x in area. And then we do the same thing down here. We go down 5. We go over x so that this rectangle is 5x. Now, you see what that does is there's that little hole there. This little hole. And we know the sum of squares. We know how big that hole is supposed to be. It's going to be 5 times 5. This is going to be 25 here. And what that tells us is that this bit that we started with right now is kind of close to something that factors. What is it close to that factors? It's kind of close to x plus 5 quantity squared. So we know that x plus 5 quantity squared is the same as x squared plus 10x. But then also, it would have to have another 25 on it. But then what that lets us do in terms of our equation, sort of translating back into the world of equations now, is it says that instead of having x squared plus 10x up here, we can rewrite this equation as x plus 5 quantity squared, as long as we make it fair by Whoops, there should be an x there. By taking away the 25, we don't have. Now, algebraically speaking, we're in a situation that should feel a lot better if we stop and think about it for a second. Because we can do this arithmetic. One forty-four minus twenty-five, or I'm sorry, the other way around. Those are both negatives, so let's say I move them both to the other side of the equation. This is 144 plus 25, and that's even easier to do. That's 169. Now I've got x on one side of the equation, and I've got something I can very neatly and easily take the square root of. I take the square root of both sides. x plus 5 is equal to, well, plus or minus the square root of 169. It turns out that 169, its square root is 13, plus or minus the square root of 13. And so x is going to be minus 5 plus or minus the square root of 13. Pretty neat, huh? By relating r quadratic to what you would have if you were to make this complete square out of it, we can replace it with something that it works with. And solving the problem via the usual rules of algebra suddenly becomes much easier. So that's completing the square via geometry. Pretty cool, huh? Almost no one ever sees that or is still awake in class when the person shows them. If you've ever seen it before and you still remember it, you should count yourself lucky. As a final step today though, let's translate this process into pure symbolic algebra. And instead of doing it with one equation, we'll do it for all quadratic equations to yield the quadratic formula. So let's go all the way back, forget all these specific numbers, and let's start with the generic quadratic equation. Do you remember what we did first last time? Yep, that's right, we divide through by a. And then if, remember this geometric step, the idea is we take x squared, and then we add these bits onto the side of it. And each of these bits has to be half of that middle term. So this is going to be x and then b over 2a, or 1 half of ba is another way to think about it. And the whole square that we're left with is going to be missing. So uh, it's going to be missing this little square in the bottom. So we want to change this into something that has the x plus b over 2a as the thing that's being squared. This is the side that's being squared to give us the big square but it's lacking this piece here. This piece here is b over 2a times b over 2a, or b squared over 4a squared. So this big square has too much in it. So to replace this bit, we have to take away that little square there. 
And now this chunk here, the big square minus the little square, is equal to this. And so we can straight up replace it by the rules of algebra. We're not changing the truth of the equation because the thing we're replacing with, with is equal to what we're changing out. Okay, and now this looks like a lot of letters, right? But again, it helps to keep your head on straight to remember that x is the thing that we want to find to have by itself and all these other letters just sort of come along for the ride. They're things that we can eventually plug in for. You know, we, we imagine ourselves as the authors of the quadratic formula in this case. And so once we solve for x for everyone else, they can come along and just plug in for it. And in just like with our, our simple example back there, this is a good situation to be in. We just have to move some stuff around. There's no x here in any of this. So we'll move all of this over and then take the square root. So far so good. Okay, now we're going to take the square root of both sides. So x plus b over 2a is equal to plus or minus the square root of b squared over 4a squared minus c over a. And that has x almost by itself. So if I want to get to the final step of having x by itself, we get x equals minus b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared over 4a squared minus c over a. Ta-da! It's a quadratic formula. Well, almost, right? So here's another homework problem for you. I claim that this is the right quadratic formula. It just needs some cleaning up to be in the form we're used to seeing it. So why don't you go ahead and try and put it in that form and see how it turns out. Can you do that for me? Great. As a second homework problem, I want you to do this process of completing the square with our original quadratic equation. If you don't remember what that is, I think I do. It's 3x squared minus 5x plus 1 equals 0. So homework problem 2 is to take that and directly complete the square with that instead of using the quadratic formula to solve it. The trick of completing the square, and this goes for doing any kind of algebra that's at least a little bit tricky and not totally obvious, is to force the equation that we have, somehow legally, to look like one that's easier for us to deal with. In this case, what would be easier to have than a perfect square? We can take the square to that, no problem. We can look at our examples of perfect squares and notice a pattern. If we start with x plus m quantity squared, the middle of that, the middle term of that, 2mx, will be twice whatever we're adding to x over here. So if we're going the opposite direction, we need to take whatever we have in the middle and divide it in half to be able to split it up and put it on those two sides geometrically. So it seems like we're almost done with the quadratic equation here. Now you know why this formula you've been asked to memorize and use over and over and over and over again. Why it actually claims to do what it does. And you might notice a pattern going here. Last week we had a linear equation where there was a first power of x. This time we've got x squared and we're talking about what to do with it. In, the, in our next episode, we're gonna be talking about cubic equations. But as a, a final coda here and a, a little bit of a preface to what we will be doing next time, I wanna show you some more flexible ways to think about polynomial equations. Equations like this. And if you had these tools in your pocket already, we wouldn't have needed to know how to complete the square. We could have solved the quadratic in a much easier way. So in our final section, I want to show you this other way to skin a pig, so to speak.